Hi, my name is Gene Kim, and I'm so delighted to be speaking to you here at ChaosConf. Um, many people are recording live, but I must admit I'm too much of a coward, so I will be recording this presentation, and I will be there during uh, the entire session to answer Q&A while I'm presenting, as well as in the Q&A session um, in 20 minutes. So I've been studying high-performing technology organizations since 1999, and that was a journey that started back when I was the CTO and founder of a company called Tripwire in the information security and compliance space. And we, our goal was to study these amazing organizations that had the best project due date performance in development, the best operational stability and reliability in ops, as well as the best posture of security and compliance. And so we just wanted to understand how did those amazing organizations make their good to great transformation so that other organizations could replicate those amazing outcomes. And as you can imagine, in a 21-year journey like that, there were many surprises. But by far, the biggest surprise was how it took me into the middle of the DevOps movement, which I think is urgent and important. The last time that any industry has been disrupted to the extent that our industry is being disrupted today was likely manufacturing when it was revolutionized through the application of the lean principles. And I think that's exactly what DevOps is. Take those same lean principles, apply them to the technology stream, value stream that we work in every day, and you end up with these crazy patterns that allow us to do hundreds or even hundreds of thousands of deployments per day while preserving reliability, security, and stability, and which enables the conditions to do even zanier things like chaos engineering. So uh, the Phoenix Project, uh, which I helped co-author, came out in 2013, and I can't overstate just how much I've learned since then. Uh, so one thing I want to share with you is our definition of DevOps that we put into the DevOps Handbook in 2016. Um, we said it was the architectural practices, the technical practices, and the cultural norms that allow us to increase our ability to deliver applications and services quickly and safely which uh, enables us to rapidly experiment and innovate, uh, deliver value in the quickest possible way to our customers while preserving world-class reliability, security, and stability. And why do we care about that? It's so that we can win in the marketplace. And so there are so many little indicators here that you know uh, we can actually do things nimbly and experiment uh, without sacrificing uh, stability. And you know, I think chaos engineering is really pushing the boundaries of that. So as much as I love that definition, uh, note that I didn't actually say what it was. Instead, I did describe the, the outcomes that we aspire to are. So um, I do like that, but there's another definition of DevOps that I like even more than this one. And it didn't come from me. It came from my friend, John Smart, uh, who led the better ways of working at Barclays for so many years, founded in the year 1634, which predates the invention of paper cash. And his uh, definition is simply this. It is better value, sooner, safer, and happier. So there are many reasons why I like this definition. One, it's shorter, and I would claim as entirely accurate as a definition that I gave you. Um, and then two is uh, it is so difficult to argue against. I mean, who wants worse value uh, later uh, in a more dangerous way uh, with more misery? Nobody. So I think uh, this definition is, I think, far more uh, saleable uh, and really gets the heart of what we all want uh in when we're doing DevOps. So um, co-wrote a book called The Phoenix Project in 2013, The DevOps Handbook in 2016, Accelerate came out in 2018. Uh, and yet I feel like there are so many problems that still remain. One is the absence of all the invisible structures required to truly make developers productive. Two is this orthogonal problem around data. So the DevOps movement rightly pointed out that it took so much heroics to get code to where it needed to go, which is in production, so that customers get value. There's another problem that's in an orthogonal universe around data, which is often trapped in systems of records, data warehouses, and it takes weeks, months, quarters to get to it to where it needs to go, which is in the hands of people who make decisions and developers to use in their daily work. Um, there's often strong opposition to support these newer ways of working and ambiguity from what we need from our leaders uh, to support such a transformation. And so this, these are the themes I want to explore in the Unicorn Project, uh, which came out uh, last year. And uh, so like the Phoenix Project had the three ways, the four types of work, the Unicorn has the five ideals. And what I'd like to do is go through each one of those ideals, uh, describe what idea looks like, what not idea looks like, and why I think they're so important for the chaos engineering community. So the first is look locality and simplicity. The second is focus, flow, and joy. The third is improvement of daily work. Uh, fourth is psychological safety. And the fifth is customer focus. So the first of these is locality and simplicity. And so if there were a story, a measure for the Phoenix Project, it really is the bus factor um, as measured by how many people need to be hit by a bus before the project, service, or 
organization is in grave jeopardy. And in the Phoenix Project, of course, the bus factor was one. In other words, if Brent got hit by a bus, no major outage could be fixed, no complex piece of work could be implemented um, because all the knowledge was in Brent's head. So we had a single point of failure. And of course, we don't want a bus factor of one. We want it to be much larger than that. We want to be reliant not on an individual, but on a team or better yet, a team of teams. And so larger is better. In the Unicorn Project, the corresponding metric would be the lunch factor, as measured by to get something that you need to get done done, how many people do you need to take out to lunch? Is it the Amazon ideal of the two pizza team where each team is independently able to create value for customers um, where you get to feed, you know, uh, or is it more like 300 people that you need to take out to lunch in order to complete a deployment because it involves two or 300 people? Or uh, if you to implement a feature, do you need to take 43 people out to lunch because you need something from them of which if any one of them says no, then suddenly you can't get done uh, what you ne needs to get done. So, um, uh, we now have to influence and persuade 43 different people. So in the ideal, anyone can implement what they need to by looking at one file, one module, one application, one container, uh, what have you, and make all your changes there and the customer will see value. Not ideal is that in order to make our changes, we have to understand and change all the files, all the modules, all the applications, uh, all the containers, uh, because uh, the functionality we have is smeared across uh, the entire estate. And so obviously we want a low, uh, we want this number to be lower uh, so that the lunch factor is lower. Secondly, uh, in the ideal, when we implement our changes, um, we want to be able to test our changes uh, in isolation from all the other components. So that's the notion of composability. We can test, uh, we can get a reason. to get in any uh, assurance that our feature will work as designed, they need to be tested in the presence of every other component. And that's what often pulls us into uh, the integrated test environment because we need to have all the other uh, components present in order to get any assurance that our function will work, right? And so this is a point of incredible coupling uh, between components of the system. Um, and so locality and simplicity is great for developers because it allows teams to work independently of each other. That's the architecture that we want. But it also enables fault isolation. In other words, small changes cause small problems, isolates the component that we're in, as opposed to causing global failures or failures in remote parts of the system uh, that we've never heard of. So the first ideal is uh, locality and simplicity. Great for developers, but also great for chaos engineers. Ideal number two is focus, flow, and joy, which I think what are what the outcomes of locality and simplicity of what it enables. And so much of this was informed by me falling in love with a functional programming language called Clojure, which runs on the JVM and also uh, transpiles into JavaScript. And this, more than anything else, has reintroduced the joy of coding back into my life. It is what changed me from self-identifying primarily as a developer for nearly 20 years, despite getting trained as a, I got my graduate degree in compiler design back in 1995. But it is this that uh, has caused me for the last four years to self-identify, not as operations, but as developers. Because, as a developer, because you can create so many amazing things with so little effort these days. But the biggest thing I learned uh, was the notion of mutability. And so the famous French philosopher, Claude Levi-Strauss would say of certain tools, is it a good tool to think with? And I think immutability, item potence, they are better tools to think with. And th those are concepts that were pioneered in programming languages, uh, in Clojure, in Haskell, uh, and things like um, uh, Elm have a, and PureScript, they have a very uh, high, uh, they embrace immutably deeply. But what is so amazing to me is that it's such a good, good tool to think with that they also show up in infrastructure and operations as well. So Docker is fundamentally immutable, right? We change a container. Uh, if we want it to persist, we have to make a new container. Kubernetes applies it not just uh, at the system level, but at the system of systems level. Um, and if you see something like Kafka, you know that someone is thinking deeply about how to create an immutable data model where it can replay uh, replay time, <laughs> we can replay events. Git and version control is fundamentally immutable, right? That's why we get yelled at if we rewrite the commit history. And, and so uh, what this enables is that in the ideal, uh, when we can uh, get rid of elective complexity caused by mutation uh, and lack of item potence, our best time and energy is spent solving the business problem and we're having fun uh, versus all our time in the not ideal is spent time 
is spent solving problems that we don't even want to solve, like YAML files, make files, dealing with spaces and file names, uh, or you know, trying to figure out how do we get to a certain state to begin with. And when I say flow, I think one of the best uh, poets about flow is Dr. Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. He wrote this amazing book called Flow, The State, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. He gave the best TED Talk of all time called Flow, The Secret to Happiness. He describes flow as when we are so immersed in our work that we lose track of time and maybe even sense of self. And so that's the amazing transcendental experience we have when we are truly doing work that we love. And so my point here is that all these better tools to think with, like immutability, item potence, uh, is good for engineering, but it's also great for chaos, uh, but also great for chaos engineering, right? And vice versa. What's good for development is also great for chaos engineering. Um, and by the way, one of my favorite uh, stories of uh, the Netflix Simian Army is one of the most uh, uh, misunderstood. I think this came from Compliance Monkey, is that they had um, a portion of Compliance Monkey uh, where they would um, look for services in their service catalog, which I think ran in service now, and look for services that didn't have an email address of a developer to escalate to. And if it wasn't there, they would kill the service in the middle of the day, <laughs> right? And so uh, it's better to do that during the working day than have to, and discover then, than discover it in the middle of night where you don't have to, if you don't know who to wake up, you have to wake up everybody, right? So it's such a great example of uh, how flow, uh, how chaos engineering can uh, create more flow for developers during the working day. So uh, the first ideal is locality and simplicity. A second ideal is uh, focus, flow, and joy. And the third ideal is improvement of daily work. So this shows up in the Phoenix Project. And uh, the notion is that improvement of daily work is more important than even daily work itself. So not ideal is twaddy, where everyone thinks that's always about the way we've always done it. What does ideal look like? I would say it's MTBTT, or make tomorrow better than today. So that is, of course, Google SRE principle number two. And I think that is almost poetic. Uh, who wouldn't want to aspire to make tomorrow better than today? And I don't care if you're dev or ops or security, that should be all our jobs. Um, and so for this one, I really wanted to share some stories that I think would dazzle anyone who loves uh, things like the Simian Army and Chaos Engineering. Um, and there are some stories that I encountered in my journey in manufacturing <clears throat> that just blew me away. So this comes from Dr. Steven Spears' amazing book called The High Velocity Edge. He is most famous for writing the most widely read uh, and most downloaded Harvard Business Review of all time. Uh, Harvard Business Review uh, article of all time. And it's called Decoding the DNA of the Toyota Production System. <laughs> and so uh, I loved his book. I ended up dog-earing uh, nearly a third of the pages. I took his workshop back at MIT in 2014. And I've actually been having weekly phone calls with him for nearly a year. Uh, and one of the things I learned uh, a couple of years ago uh, when reading his book was how deeply some of the notions that we find in chaos engineering shows up uh, in the Toyota production process. So one of the things that uh, ASIN, so this is a tier one Toyota supplier, they would make the seats uh, uh, and many other parts within the car. So it's one of their top suppliers. And uh, suppose they had uh, two production lines for, uh, and th I think the specific example was seat cushions, um, each capable of producing 100 units a day. So on slow days, they would actually send all the production onto one line, trying to find ways to increase capacity, identify vulnerabilities in their process, knowing that if something goes wrong, they could switch all the jobs to the other line, uh, essentially flipping the load balancer from A to B. And so by doing this, uh, they did this because they could increase capacity in a safe way way uh, and integrate this into their daily work. Uh, I love this, and I think this would resonate with anyone who loves the notion of you know chaos monkeys killing production instances, but uh, ASIN uses it as a way to figure out how to increase capacity in their daily work. Um, another more uh, breathtaking example is the 1997 Toyota brake fire. So this was a stunning uh, economic headline news because in February 4th, 1997, those Wall Street Journal reported that um, potentially the entire production capacity of Toyota motor vehicles in Japan would be shut down. At that time, that was 16,000 vehicles per day, all ground to a halt because of a brake fire, a fire in a brake parts factory of which every um, plant depended upon. So the Wall Street Journal was estimating that Toyota would uh, each day incur $40 million of lost profits. Um, 
and uh, as, uh, people were heralding the uh, um, the failure of just-in-time manufacturing. Uh, in fact, I don't know if I have the slide here, but uh, uh, $40 million a day, I think that was considered to be like 0.3% of global GDP. Ah, oh, it's right here. So each day that the brake um, capacity, this P valve uh, that cost $10 was um, would be hobbling the 14,000 day production capacity of uh, the Toyota production system. Each day that this happened, 0.1% of global of Japanese GDP would be shaved off, which uh, incidentally I have to think is like Netflix is the opposite, right? No more <laughs> people would say Netflix is actually retarding GDP uh, because it's actually uh, taking away from uh, productive daily work. I'm just kidding, by the way. Uh, but this just shows how much of an economic problem this posed. But everyone was amazed that one uh, week later, 90% of production capacity was uh, restored. And how did they do this? It's because um, essentially they mobilized the entire Toyota supplier network to figure out how to make P-valves. ASIN shared all relevant design plans to every um, supplier in the Toyota production network. Um, they gathered uh, every machine on hand, including things at trade shows, uh, trying to figure out other, um, find any equipment that could uh, help in the production of uh, these P-valves. Nearly a thousand uh, Toyota engineers were dispersed throughout the Toyota production system and their suppliers trying to figure out you know, how they could restore production capacity. So this is a, an ama to me, this is an exa amazing example of resilience uh, that was being built in uh, to the Toyota production system. This was just another, I wouldn't say it's just another day, but uh, all of the collaboration and routines within the pro production system led to this kind of natural response. Because everyone knew that what's uh, what's bad for Toyota is bad for the entire supplier network. So if that weren't grand enough in terms of scale, uh, check this one out. Uh, in 2002, the entire supply chain was disrupted when um, there was a ship st uh, worker strike that essentially shut down t all 29 ports on America's West Coast. Um, and so... Uh, this presented a huge problem. Uh, it's not just one part now, it's every part going into North America. And uh, it was not easy to solve. These ships couldn't divert to Canada because the unions uh, were sympathetic. Uh, they couldn't go to Mexico uh, because there wasn't uh, sufficient rail and road infrastructure to take the parts north. Uh, in fact, and they couldn't go through the Panama Canal because the ships were too big. So what did they do? Well, it turns out uh, uh, they didn't have a choice. All the parts were dumped in Mexico because uh, uh, the ship owners... Uh, said it's Toyota's problem, not ours. They bought up all the 747 freight capacity. Their goal was to create an air bridge from Japan uh, to the United States to try to resume production. Uh, after they ran out of 747s, they found every Antonov plane, uh, uh, Russian Soviet planes. Um, uh, they actually had to land in Mexico, but uh, Mexico is closer than Japan. So uh, they then... Um, put down senior leaders with the only mission of trying to get these parts north. <laughs> and so uh, the big lesson here is this wonderful quote from one of the people involved in this response. They said, because we solve real problems all the time in our daily work, when real crises hit, it's just a matter of degree. So the lesson here is when improvement of daily work is integrated into our uh, how we work, it forges greatness and adaptability. And I think a great book that talks about this so wonderfully is The Talent Code uh, by Mr. Coyle. Um, so the third ideal uh, for me, ideal looks like when we're taking three to 5% of our best engineers and they're dedicated to improving developer productivity to using techniques like chaos engineering uh, to create resilience. At Google, they famously have over 1,500 developers tasked on dev productivity. Microsoft's probably three to five times more than that. Not ideal is that the only people working on dev productivity and things like chaos engineering are the people not good enough to be developers. So the fourth ideal, the first ideal is locality and simplicity. The second ideal is focus, flow, and joy. The third ideal uh, is improvement of daily work. And the fourth ideal is psychological safety. It was so fun for me in researching the Unicorn Project to revisit the works of uh, Project Aristotle and Project Oxygen at Google. Uh, this was, of course, the quest they had to figure out the elements that made great teams great. And in this multi-year study, um, Spanning multiple years, they found that the top element was, of course, psychological safety. As measured by to what degree do members on a team feel safe to take risks, to say what they really think without fear of being uh, embarrassed, insecure, or punished. <laughs> and this was actually a higher predictor of performance than dependability, structure and clarity, meaning of work, and impact of work. 
And of course, this will resonate uh, very much with this community because as much as we love talking about blameless postmortems and chaos monkeys and all the things in the Simian army, none of that is possible without psychological safety. After all, what sort of maniac would take down production infrastructure, right? Knowing that it would uh, actually take mission critical systems down, right? That requires a huge degree of psychological safety. And so for people who follow the state of DevOps research, this is the work that I get to do with Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Jez Humble uh, since 2013 uh, with a cross-population study that spanned over 35,000 respondents. We know that one of the top predictors is to what degree um, is culture, to what degree is information hidden? Are messengers a bad news shot? Do we discourage bridging between teams? We cover up failures and new ideas are crushed versus the generative behaviors uh, that we see when we seek information. We train messengers to tell bad news. We we encourage bridging between teams because uptime is not just ops's job, just like infosec is not just infosec's job. It's everybody's job. And when failures happen, it causes a genuine sense of inquiry. And so this, of course, is based on the famous work of Dr. Ron Westrom. Dr. Ron Westrom studied healthcare organizations, trying to understand what was associated with the best patient outcomes. And he found uh, that back in 2004 that those organizations with the best patient outcomes had generative cultures. Those with the worst patient outcomes had uh, pathological cultures. So the first ideal is around uh, locality and simplicity. The second ideal is around focus, flow, and joy. The third ideal is improvement of daily work. The fourth ideal is psychological safety. And the fifth ideal is uh, customer focus. So just to share the context behind the story of probably one of the biggest aha moments I've had in my professional career, uh, I got to spend a day with the CEO of CompuWare, uh, who I've learned so much from over the years. I was with my friend, Dr. McKirsten. We were walking to the building, and I looked down, and the first item on the agenda is a data center tour. And I felt immediately embarrassed. I told my friend Mick, I don't know why we're getting a data center tour, because uh, I don't know what we'll learn by looking at their halon extinguishers. And yet, what I saw in the data center uh, blew my mind. So it was essentially empty. You had two Z mainframes because they are a mainframe vendor. Uh, and then you saw 40 to 50,000 square feet of empty data center space. You see these green outlines on the floor where the server racks used to be. And in the middle of each, there's a tombstone with the name of the business process and application that used to run there and how much money they saved by getting rid of it. And so you can see on the side over 17 tons of equipment uh, removed and recycled, sent to a better place. And the reason why I think this is so important is the notion of core versus context. Uh, Dr. Geoffrey Moore in his amazing book, Zone to Win, said, Core are the core competencies of the organization that create lasting, durable business advantage that customers are willing to pay us money for. And context is everything else. And so what that picture from CompuWare shows is $8 million of context that were redeployed into core. So mission, uh, ERP systems, email, uh, payroll systems are important, mission critical even, but customers don't care uh, if we have... Uh, world-class ones, right? However, uh, they absolutely do care if our products are great. And so not ideal is that functional silo managers prioritize silo goals over the grandest business goals. Ideal is functional silo managers or everybody for that instance um, can look at what they do and say, is this core? Is it creating lasting durable business advantage that customers are willing to pay us for? Or is it context? And if it's not core, is this work that we should be doing at all? So why do I think this is important? I love this quote. The world is changing very fast. Big will not beat small anymore. Instead, it is fast beating the slow. And I think chaos engineering and the mindsets that create zany things like the Simian army are what's required to help us win in the marketplace. And so the five ideals are really my attempt to elevate things that I think are so important to every organization. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this day. If you're interested in the slides, please ask our amazing hosts. I'm available for Q&A. And if you're interested in seeing all the presentations from DevOps Enterprise and excerpts of basically everything I've written, just send an email to realgenekim at sendyourslides.com, subject line DevOps, uh, and you'll get an automated response in a minute or two. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to your amazing questions. Thank you. Thanks for that amazing talk, Gene. So as mentioned before, Gene is in the Slack channel and he's been conversing with everybody there for this entire time. He's also with us in person. So we do have the opportunity for some Q&A if folks want to submit any questions. I think we yes. have time for- Jason, can you hear me? 
I can. Yeah. Hey, Dean. <laughs> hey, thanks for uh, accommodating our record. I, I just, uh, friends of mine, they say uh, only do live if you need danger life. And I found that to be actually uh, advice I've taken to heart. So thanks for accommodating our recording. I, I think it's uh, uh, the way to go for me. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that you do for DevOps Enterprise Summit, which is coming up. That's right. It's next week, and uh, it was great that uh, Colton um, and um, uh, one of their clients uh, spoke in uh, London Virtual, and uh, they will again be uh, next week, which I think is awesome. Uh, and my congratulations to the Gremlin team for all their successes. Yeah. So just a, a quick shout out for those who haven't, uh, DevOps Enterprise Summit is coming up next week. Um, actually, Matt Simons and myself are, are presenting yeah. there. So Matt, who you saw earlier this morning, uh, you can go check out that talk. We do have one question that came in um, from Austin who said, Gene, you likened digital transformation to the manufacturing transformation. Does that also mean that digital transformation might at some point slow down or plateau? <laughs> um, I, I, it could, but I, mean, I, I think it's pretty safe to say. Uh, let, let me give you my perspective on this. So uh, um, in, there's been five revolutions, uh, you know, whether it's the age of steam, the age of rail, the age of oil, the age of... Uh, uh, heavy industry um, you know, has ushered in you know a change in management methods uh, that typically last about 50 years and each one of them also bringing in a golden age of you know 20 30 years of prosperity and so the, the last time we experienced that was uh, post world war ii that led to the greatest economic expansion that the uh, we've ever seen in civilization um, and so with the age of software and data right i think this is what is making uh, you know management methods of the last century so unsuitable right we know what happened so uh, when you have these kind of rigid command and control structures uh, is just so uh, deeply unsuited for knowledge work. And, and so as interesting as the tech giants are, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Apple, Microsoft, uh, you know, the real action <laughs> the, you know, the, is, is how those principles that were pioneered there are going to be adopted by, you know, every industry vertical. So what so surprised me about the DevOps Enterprise Summit, it is every, you know, the most recognized brands across every industry vertical and government agencies, you know, taking those principles and patterns, using it to survive and win in the marketplace. And that's what is what I find so inspiring. And I have no doubt that uh, when that happens, when that's fully embraced and adopted, you know, things like chaos engineering, uh, DevOps and so forth, uh, you know, that's going to lead to trillions of dollars of economic value, you know, that will last for decades, right? So, you know, when you do that, you know, suddenly impossible problems seem, you know, possible to solve, you know, whether it's climate change or whatever, right? When you can inject trillions of dollars into uh, the economy, right? Uh, suddenly you can actually pay for, you know, things that seem insurmountable now. So the long uh, way of saying is like, I would not uh, bet on digital transformation being a passing fad. <laughs> it's really quite the opposite. Uh, you know, the age of software and data uh, is gonna change the world for the next 50 years. And by the way, you wanted to see the barking dog. This is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great response. Um, I also think it's an interesting question, right? Because it assumes that manufacturing has has plateaued. But I think we've seen the transformation of that to uh, the de democratization of manufacturing yeah. with things like 3D printers. And I think that closely mirrors the idea of you know digital transformation and people going remote and having these remote teams and being able to get the best talent from everywhere, uh, you know? And so just like, uh, you know, it might seem like there's a plateau. I think there are these transformations that are still happening. Um, and like you said, we'll, we'll see those in the digital age. I, can I add just one brief point on that, Jason? Yeah, so like, go. Uh, we're like 5% of the way there, maybe 3%, right? There's about 20 million developers on the planet, right? How many of them are really working in a devops -y like way? You know, at best, you know, 1 million. That's 5%. So we have 95% to go. So uh, the uh, the best of chaos engineering is ahead of us, certainly not behind us. Absolutely. Cool. We are coming up to the top of the hour here, which means that we are about at time. So I'm going to encourage everyone uh, to go over to the QA-Gene-Kim channel. Join Gene in the Slack. He'll be hanging out there for, for quite a while. Uh, answering your questions and just chatting um, as he does. So thanks again, Gene. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. And uh, have a great remainder of your conference. <laughs> See you soon, Jason.